This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host on SNN Network. And today joining me for this Wall Street View is Mr. Nate Tobik from oddballstocks.com. Nate, welcome back. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's great to have you back, and uh, it's been a while. It's been about two years. It's yeah, Yes, it has. <laughs> yep, I've been busy the last two years. So it's, uh, it's good to be back, though. Well, good. I'm glad you're busy. So, uh, so let's let's start with your background. For those who may have missed our uh, our first podcast interview, you know, how did you get your start in the world of finance and then founding OddballStocks.com? Sure. So they're kind of intertwined. Um, I started off as a, a software developer and um, just realized I liked investing. Um, I had a very small inheritance from um, from a grandfather, and I kept getting statements every month, and I thought. Um, I should figure out what what this is. It was in it was in stocks, and um, so started to research and realized that I I was fascinated by by companies and investing in research, and so I started to network locally. Um, ended up talking to the um, portfolio manager for an endowment for I guess a, a giant healthcare chain, and um, he said I should I should. If I wanted to become an equity analyst, I should uh, get the CFA designation. So I uh, started studying for that, took the, um, the first and the second level, and um, ended up failing the second one. And um, I got the failure while I was on vacation in um, Florida, and I was sitting by the pool kind of thinking about this. And I thought, you know, if I would have spent as much time studying as – if I spent as much time researching as I did studying, um, I would probably – be better off just investing my own money, especially because I, I kind of realized at the time uh, to go from being a software engineer to an entry level equity analyst, it was going to be like a 50% salary haircut. So I thought, <laughs> you know, if I keep, keep that extra 50% and I spend my time uh, looking at these companies and investing in the long run, I'll be better off. And so um, to do that, I, I'm just a very like, you know, when I go places, I go, um, I go one way and then come back a different way. And I, I'm just not a structured person. And so to keep track of um, what I was researching and, and what I was doing, I decided I needed to, to put it somewhere where I could, could actually get access to it. So I started the blog as just this, uh, like a public place that from any computer, I could always get to my thoughts. And so I started writing what I was finding there. And uh, it just has grown and grown uh, now. It's almost been nine years. Not, wow. Yeah, nine years. I started in 2010. So it's mm -hmm. um, it's been going on a while. Yeah. <laughs> nice, man. You know, I got to ask real quick, too, is um, uh, when you were starting to study for your CFA, I mean, you weren't actually working at, a, a or at any kind of financial institution. You just decided, you know, I'm going to study for this and get my CFA. I mean, I figure some people might not know that you can just go and do that. You, you can do that. Yeah. Um, you know, it turns out the CFA Institute and sorry for anyone who's listening, who's part of that, um, you know, they're a nonprofit like any other that likes money. And so they will take anyone's fees and uh, they don't care if you pass or if you don't pass, they just want to make sure that Great. they have that inflow of, of fees every year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's well, you know what? Uh, wait, did you end up getting your CFA at, at any point? I didn't. You... No, I, I, you know, I stopped after um, after I failed the second level. And, you know, interestingly though, like all of that self learning was the value was in the learning, mm -hmm. and I I applied all of those, you know, the stuff I learned in there because I mean, like I said, my degrees in computer science, um, but you know, now I I have that finance foundation. Um, I've looked at it though with what I've done from oddball stocks and then what I've done um, with the software company I have complete bank data if I would if I actually would finish I would qualify to um, you know to get the designation but at this point it would just be a vanity thing so it's I I don't know I maybe one day if I have nothing else to do I'll, I'll pick it up again there's no t it doesn't expire the so I could always get back into Listen, it I you got some wall space right there I see it I, I see the That's, CFA I see it right there I, I, maybe <laughs> one day yeah <laughs> anyways so the the today the the reason I had you on was actually not specifically to talk about the CFA exam but uh, it was to talk about a, a recent blog post that you published called uh, what is an oddball stock? Now, I, I figured let's start with the obvious question here. 
for you, what, what is an oddball stock? So I, I think the best way to encapsulate it is it's any sort of company that is just out of the mainstream. So, um, and that was kind of what I thought when I founded the blog, it was like any weird securities, any sort of, um, companies that it's, it's harder to find information on anything that's not in the mainstream. And, and actually what fueled that was, um, it was from the CFA because that curriculum was so heavy in, in efficient markets that everything's efficient. And um, I remember it was in the second level in the equity analyst book, there was a paragraph and it said that um, individual investors who look in small and inefficient markets where institutional money, there's no institutional money, um, can find outsized returns. And it was just this paragraph kind of at the end of a chapter and that caught my eye and it was like, okay, so there's these pockets of opportunity. You just have to find what they are mm -hmm. and exploit those. And so, you know, kind of the idea behind the whole oddball stocks is like, these are, we're looking at those pockets wherever they might be. And, um, but it's not something you're going to see on the front page of Barron's. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you, cause I have to also follow up, you know, you said that you started the blog about, I'd say it's about 10 years now. And then finally, you know, a month ago, you come out with this article talking about what is an oddball stock. And yet the website's been called oddball stocks for this entire time. I mean, what inspired you then to finally put out this article? Did you see, all right, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've kind of found what I think actually are oddball. Even at the time, I didn't know. But now I kind of know to myself. No, it, um, so I would say maybe like a third of the posts, no, not a third, maybe maybe a quarter of the posts um, that end up on the blog. It's because I've just received so many emails asking the same questions over and over. It's easier to do a post that answers that question. <laughs> and then you stop getting those emails. And so, you know, people are just kind of wondering what what is something. And, um, you know, I mean, as I look right now, and so what have, it's, I mean, there's... I don't know, four or 500 posts. Uh, so if someone was to read that whole volume of work, um, God bless them if they do, you know, that <laughs> you would figure it out, right? You could, you could kind of get it. Um, but if someone comes in and they read something now and they weren't following along in 2013, uh, they could kind of get up to speed real quick. All right. Well, I'm, I'm hoping this video will help in that regard as well. Uh, so, <laughs> for so, sure. Yes. <laughs> so let's dig into the post itself. You know, you you listed a, a about four factors that make up what an oddball stock is. You know, to start with the first one, you say that that oddball stocks are potentially or usually small companies. Why is that? Well, so you know, if you're let's just say that you're some sort of a a really strange company, and um, I don't know, let's just make something up. You know, you you could turn pool water into gold with some little chemical, right? And you start out with nothing and it's, this is like the total fool's gold thing. If you're able to, you don't have to have any earnings as we know in the market now, you don't even have to have any revenue. If you just have an idea, once you're able to cross a certain market capitalization threshold, suddenly everyone knows about you. And it's, it's the flywheel thing that right. the momentum builds on itself. So if you're able to pump this chemical that is going to turn everyone's pool into gold uh, and you're able to get up to, you know, a 10, 20 billion dollar valuation, suddenly you're now this established company. Mm -hmm. And all the only reason you're established is because you have a, a capitalization. You don't have to have revenue. You don't have to have a real product. You don't even have to have any pro profits. Nothing at all. Just all you have to do is have that market capitalization. And um, that's definitely true with where we are today. You know, you see companies that are IPOing, and they're structurally that they, they will never make money, and it doesn't matter. To, people don't seem to care, and they're worth billions and hundreds of billions. Um, there's companies that are structurally bankrupt that have high market capitalizations, and people don't care. They have high share prices. It just More doesn't money. matter. <laughs> yeah, and so. Um, and then the flip side is a lot of the companies that we look at, they are profitable and, uh, sometimes they're growing, sometimes they aren't growing, but it's, they're established. Some of them are established brands. So, um, one company is Hanover foods, which I've owned shares for years. Uh, if you're anywhere in the East coast and you go to a grocery store, I mean, they're frozen food, they're canned vegetables. They're all over the shelves. It's an established brand. 
and uh, they're traded. They are profitable. They make a few hundred million dollars a year in revenue. And it's just, it's very hard to get information about them. And they fall into the oddball category. Whereas, um, you know, we work, which everyone knows about, which, you know, prior to them, you know, working to come public, it's like no one knew anything about their financials. Um, that they, they're not going to be profitable. They're they're just leasing office space from other people. I mean, and it's a just a crazy it's a crazy system. But they will have the car- capitalization that everyone will know everything about them. A mm-hmm. bunch of analysts are going to be covering them, and um, that's just that's the structure of things. Uh, no, I mean, well, first things first. Are, I'm I'm just assuming uh, you are not a shareholder of WeWork. Just no, no. <laughs> just assuming that, and, and and secondly, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up because I mean, I'm in, I'm finishing my last semester of business school, and it's yeah, it's easier to have the conversation about some of these more well known names that are public, you know, even if they're not profitable yet. It's just it's easier to to go through that, but still at the same time, I'm I'm itching inside because I'm just like, why can't we talk about a small cap name, you know, something between. I mean, I you I think the market capitalization you said in the blog post for a smaller company that you look for is between, I think you said as low as a million market cap, dollar million market cap, to a billion, right? I think that's right. what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And and I mean, so you know, a lot of times small cap funds, mutual funds, uh, they start at a billion dollars, and so I mean, anything below that is it's smaller hedge funds and um, individuals and. You know, people are out there working hard to executives of these companies are working hard to bring visibility to their to their name and their brand. Right. And it's very difficult to get. Yeah. All right. So then I think this this next point, you, you spent the most time talking about this point in, in the post itself. And it was in regard to that uh, a potential oddball stock usually has a paucity of information. <laughs> and by paucity, we mean it just there's a, a dearth. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm throwing too many big words out there. There's not that much information about them. Uh, right. <laughs> so, so on that point, you know, why, why would you then say that uh, these, these oddball stocks are, are more likely to be inefficiently priced? So um, someone told me this was years ago. They said with, um, you know, an oddball stock or an unlisted stock or something pink sheets, they said it's usually heaven or hell. And uh, that's the reason that there's not much information coming out. So heaven being uh, you have some stock trading at $10 that's earning $8 a share. And um, hell being it is trading at at $50 a share and management has looted everything. And, um, you know, every first cousin, second cousin and eighth cousin is working there earning a half million dollars a year and they don't want you to know about it. And so it's the analyst's job to understand which ones fall into which category. And there's, you know, I think there's actually a lot that, um, kind of back to an earlier comment, the, the issue is really that these people who operate these companies are, are good operators, right? And so um, if you're, you know, a water purification company, you care about purifying water. Right. You don't care about selling your stock. And um, a lot of times what will happen is companies that do really well, the, the, uh, the product is the stock. And you have an executive who is selling the stock. The, the actual product that is earning the, the revenue and um, the profits, at the end of the day, it almost doesn't even matter. It's the stock that's the story. And um, we, you see this a lot. There's... Um, Oh man, I don't remember the company now. They were doing like an additive, a sweetener additive, something for Pepsi, and um, and I mean they were like the classic story stock, and they yeah, sold the heck about. out of this story, and the stock went up, and everyone loved it, and you know they're always still testing, and it's like the results are just right around the corner. We'll get to it, it next quarter, next quarter, and. You know, but meanwhile, so, let's go raise some money and dilute everybody, you know, exactly. because, but yes. it's coming, but it's coming, it's coming, it's coming down. <laughs> yes. just, just wait, just wait a couple more quarters. And, you know, they were able to, to get, I don't remember what their market cap went to, but they, a bunch of hedge funds got in that one and it became popular and the stock was the product. 
And so when you look at a lot of these oddball names, the stock is not the product. Um, in some cases, you have operators who are not financially savvy in the sense that they know their operating margins, their gross margins, they know how to make money. But when you talk to them about buying back shares, they don't know what's involved. They don't know if you could do that or not. Um, when you talk about paying dividends, they they don't, you know, it's like, well, we're not sure why we, we would do that because we want to keep the money in the company's bank account. And they're just not financially savvy. And so that that results in this inefficiency that they don't know how to talk to shareholders. And um, you know, shareholder, the reason story stocks work is because shareholders like to hear certain things. Mm -hmm. And um, when executives can say those things to them, it's just sales, right? They're just selling to shareholders. And there was that book, The Outsiders, mm -hmm. um, that I someone had, had wrote that it had become a best hit amongst executives because they all wanted to learn what the things they needed to say to shareholders were to get a higher valuation. They didn't care about doing the outsider things. They just cared about saying the right things <laughs> to get that valuation. And you know, there if if your product is a stock, then shareholders are the consumers and the executives are doing the ones that, you know, they're selling. And a lot of people don't they don't quite appreciate that dynamic. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, so they are happy to get information out there. When you start to fall down the market capitalization chain, you find people who are good at doing what they do and um, they don't know how to sell the stock or sell the company. And, and, and that's the, and to do that, they don't, you know, it's like, maybe we don't, I don't care if financials get out. Why, why would we care? Right. You know, things like that. I see. Well, cause I guess the, my follow up to that is, you know, is it really, what's really the difference then between a management team that is a great business operator not so much on the capital market side versus them just saying, you know, I just have to, I'm putting out the bare minimum here, you know? So like, what, what's that difference there? Cause well, I, so I see that there, there, there is a big difference. And um, so some of these companies, they, they're interested in putting out the bare minimum and often it's because there's some other dynamic. So mm -hmm. um, it's maybe something where a grandfather started the company. Most of these are family companies. So having that understanding, the grandfather started it and then uh, one of the children took over <clears throat> and then now it's the, the third generation. But that the father who took over, they also had siblings who did not work for the company. And now there's those siblings. So there's some aunts and uncles and then there's some other cousins. And it's like, we don't want them to know how good it is. And, um, you know, so it's like we interesting. They, they're not worried about the outside shareholder. They're worried about you know, Aunt Rita, knowing that they're sitting on this little pot of gold because then she would want part of the pot of gold. And, um, you know, and so, for example, I actually I ran into this in person um, at a company in Pittsburgh here, Cop Glass, which I own a couple shares. And um, I went to an annual meeting. The first one I went to, the only other people there were the um, the late wife uh, or the wife of the late president. And um and then one of the, it was like a niece of the founder or something. Mm -hmm. And she said, I didn't know anyone could buy it. It's just sitting in my safe deposit box. And I just get these dividends every year. And the dividends are so awesome. And they were paying like a seven or 8% dividend at the time. Mm -hmm. And she was like, no one knows, like, no one knows what's happening. Like what's going on, what, and, um, you know, it's a very family type thing. They looked at it like family. And to that point, they actually would send out, they, um, they do like glass light bulbs, like railroad lights and air, airplane lights and stuff, weird like blown glass. So um, for registered shareholders who was like 99.9% .9 their family, mm -hmm. they would send out this giant ornate blown glass Christmas gift every year. It's so and lovely. It is. And it's <laughs> so, you know, it's like we're taking care of our family. You own part of this glass company. You get this glass thing every year. Uh -huh. And, um, that, that was just their tradition, but it was, you know, they, they did all, that woman, none of her family knew what was going on there, mm -hmm. that this was a company that was at a few times cash flow, that it was growing well. They were doing something like a 30% return on equity. If you stripped out their excess cash and 
I mean, it's it was just a crazy little company and they're paying the seven to eight percent dividend. That dividend was enough to pacify everyone. <laughs> and they didn't need to give out any additional information beyond that. So they were good operators. They, you know, that there might have been some savviness there and knowing how to keep other people from speaking out. But right. um, you know, now at the same time, there's other companies where they're putting out the minimum information and they're okay operators. Um so a company like this, uh, they were just sold as Randall Bearings, and they were trading. They they would not release anything, and um, then someone fought them with a lawsuit, and they started putting out an annual report, bare minimum. They actually were a decent a decent company, um, and they grew and then sold to their largest shareholder, but they kept everyone in the dark the whole time, mm. and the reason was because the executive, the CEO, wanted to buy them out at a cheap valuation. And, um, you know, he ended up being able to do that. Well, the biggest little, se- well, firstly, first things first, did, were you a shareholder of, uh, was it Randall Technologies? Randall Bearings. Yeah. Right, yes. Right. So sold out. They, I owned Randall Bearings. I found them, it was like two bucks a share mm-hmm. and they went up to 25 or $30 a share. And, um, I don't remember what they ultimately sold for. Um, it was something North of that though. Mm-hmm. And it might've been, yeah, it was, that was a, that was an awesome run, but I mean, you couldn't get anything. Mm-hmm. Well, you, I mean, I guess you, what one big point to pull out of that, I'd say, is that a big little secret might be that, you know, even if you're a public company, especially if you're on the OTC, you don't necessarily have to be fully reporting to be on the pinks. That's I mean, correct. I mean, that's yes. that it sounds like yep. those are the ones that you're you you're kind of combing to look for. We're looking for those. You know, the other thing, too, is. Um, I mean, what I love is these just information inefficiency. So for a while, I had a habit of um, every morning I'd go to OTC markets and I would just look at all of the new news releases and the financials for that day. And Mm -hmm. like people hear that and they're like, oh my gosh, that's insane. But it was only like, I don't know, 100 companies each day. And I could, I would open them before they changed their website. You could open them all in a new tab. So I'd have a new tab for each one and I'd go through and you could scroll through really quick. And so like, there was always these total junk companies where it's like they have $1 in their bank account. They somehow <laughs> lost a million dollars. And you're like, this is just some weird scammy thing. And mm-hmm. you could close out of that in about five or 10 seconds. And um, the value, though, was I can't tell you the number of times where you would see a huge earnings report that came out. And you could buy the stock at the open or even within the first couple hours of trading at yesterday's close price and nothing moved. And then suddenly it jumps up five or 10%. Or there would be things where, um, you know, there'd be a merger announcement. And I was able to buy mergers before. It's like the, they just didn't move. And these aren't, you know, it's like they're publishing their news on OTC markets. This isn't something where you're trying to call someone up and send in a stock certificate for information. I mean, it's just out there in front of you every day. Mm-hmm. Or they would pay you know, they were going to be paying some large dividend and all these things. And it's like, they wouldn't move on the news. And sometimes there was a couple of cases where I would buy a stock and it was like two days later, I'm thinking, did I make a mistake? Did I not understand this? Because the stock still hadn't moved. And then finally it gets a jump. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's just, that's how it works. I mean, you literally, uh, you started answering my next question, which was one of the next factors is that you know, most all oddball stocks are liquid, you know, so you clearly just went through the advantage right here. But how, why are they, most of these oddball stocks illiquid? I mean, so they're just, it's an interest thing, you know, yeah. to my earlier point, the capitalization isn't that high and there's just not as much interest. And um, so you could take advantage on the upside. You could also take advantage on the downside. So a company I owned shares of for a while and I don't anymore was Titanium Holdings. Mm-hmm. And it traded at like 15 cents a share, like forever. And um, one day it went down to to eight cents a share or so and on a ton of volume. And I thought either something's going on or someone's just dumping shares. And so I knew I had a friend at the time who was a market maker and he said, oh, all the shares are coming from um, it was like Morgan Stanley's. Um, you know, like their investment advisor division or whatever. That was like, you could see that. 
And so I was like, this has got to be someone who had inherited shares right. and they told their financial advisor, just go ahead and get it. And the only price they could get was about half the market. So I just started buying as much as I could. And um, finally, the liquidity dried up that afternoon. And I don't know, it's like two or three weeks later, they're back to 15 cents. <laughs> and then so it's like, OK, so I, I pretty much doubled my money. And then it took me a while to actually sell those down and get out. <laughs> but, the, you know. So on the downside, it's like these things will sell off when someone wants out quickly mm-hmm. and there's no buyers. And then there's kind of like this, you know, neutral price where things hang around in the market and it'll gravitate towards that. And then, you know, you could sell back there. And so being able to take advantage of opportunities when um, there's some news inefficiency or being able to take advantage of an opportunity when uh, there's an you know, liquidity opportunity, you just have to, to be able to take advantage. And I think that's actually one, one thing that's really important is, um, you know, like people will buy Berkshire Hathaway and it's like, they hold it forever because it's this stock that's worth holding for 50 years. Um, but I think when you start to trade down with oddball stocks, the mentality should be, you know, This company that maybe was making faucets 150 years ago will probably be making faucets in 150 years, but that doesn't mean you need to hold them for 150 years. It just means that you need to buy when there's an opportunity, and then when there's an opportunity to sell, you sell, because that's how you make your money. It's not holding some little $12 million company forever. It's Mm -hmm. being opportunistic and and being able to trade. Gotcha. And and for full disclosure, are you a shareholder of uh, Berkshire? I might own one. You know, I do own one share because I get, I think I get the annual report. I was getting paper copies of the annual report. Oh, nice. And I, because I thought like, I'd like to have like this library of them. I'm, I'm looking here in my bookshelf. I think I got this year's. So I did own them at one point and then I <laughs> sold everything except for one share to just to get the report. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So I, I think I still have that one share. So, so the last factor that you mentioned uh, for for an oddball stock, this one was the most surprising to me. You know, so why why are oddball stocks usually older companies? Well, so I think some of this goes back to um, some of the earlier points, which is they're very well. There's actually a, a number of reasons, but they're very focused on their product, mm-hmm. and um, so. Let me explain this sort of by way of an analogy there. If you Google um, cassette, I think it's like cassette maker, Bloomberg.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's an awesome video they did. I don't know, maybe like three, four years ago now of there's only a single company making cassettes. And he was making cassettes back in the 70s and 80s. And then it was this total commodity thing. And he barely stayed alive. And he was conservative and he stayed alive. Every one of his competitors failed. And now cassettes are back in again. And he was saying, he's like, this is crazy. I've never made as much money as I'm making now. (laughs) And so he would be an oddball company, right? He, Mm -hmm. it was, there was a ton of them, a ton of cassette makers. And now there's just one and he's earning outsized returns but when you try and pitch a sexy stock, it's like, hey, look, this company is making cassette tapes. That's not, you know, it, people aren't interested in that. Um, and so there's no, you know, there would not be market visibility. I, I think they're a private company for all I know. There's not market visibility. This same thing actually happened with uh, 3.5 inch floppy disks. And every single person made the floppy disks. And if you look now on the internet, there's only one company that manufactures these things. And so it's, it's really hard. I, this, you know, I mean, I'm same with Polaroid. Uh, and there's actually an excellent documentary on Netflix about this, mm-hmm. where they got all these old Polaroid engineers together to try and figure out how to get the machines to work and make these things. Well, now they're making a bunch of money because they're the only one. So a lot of these companies, they're older. They were, they were nothing special back in the day and they just happened to survive and now they're making better money than they ever have in the past mm-hmm. just by existing. Uh, but <laughs> people aren't interested in yesterday's technology. And so it's like, we want a smartphone app. We don't want Polaroid pictures. 
And even though Polaroid pictures were the smartphone app back in the 70s or right. 60s where they were, and, and I think that's kind of the way to think about these things. And so, and when you think about that, so let's say the Polaroid to that documentary, these people were so passionate about Polaroid and the chemicals and the machines, mm -hmm. and they loved it. And that's probably why these companies survive is they love this thing that, that they have. Uh, and they don't, they don't care to tell the world about cassette tapes. They just want to make cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, it, with technology, it's an, it's an interesting thought process because when I'm thinking about, you know, like Polaroid or cassette tapes or even the floppy disk manufacturers, you know, and they're saying that now they're gaining outsized returns more so than they ever did. I mean, is there like, is there more of a nostalgia fact, factor there then let's say the faucet company you're talking about, we're like, they're always going to make faucets. There's always going to be probably a need for faucets, you know? So I, mean? I think, it, well, I think, so the, where I was going with this is a lot of oddball companies also seem to live in this little niche mm -hmm. and the niche is they are able to earn. So it's, and I wrote about this a couple years ago, but they're able to earn outsized returns because they're the only surviving company who does this. So Cop Glass, the glass company, they're doing these runway lights and these airplane things and like railroad lanterns. And there's not a lot of people buying railroad lanterns. You know, there, there's not a ton of new airports being built, but they're, it's them and then um, the president, the son who owns a competitor down the street who's doing the same thing. That's it. That's, those are the only people in the world who do this thing. Mm -hmm. And so in that little niche, it's very limited demand, but it's enough to employ a few hundred people. And, um, and a lot of oddballs fit that. So uh, I don't remember what Randall, if Randall Bearings, they were doing something with nuts and screws. Um, there's a lot of these little companies and almost every single one of them, they're in some little niche. And so part of the, you know, the paradox is, they earn outsized returns, but they cannot grow because their market is fixed. Mm -hmm. And so it's like to grow, they would need to do something else. And so here and there, you'll actually see that, um, you know, they'll say, we're going to expand this new line. We're doing this whole new thing now. And people get very wary about that. It's like, I don't know if this is going to be profitable. I don't know if it's going to be good. And, um, you know, and that there's risk in that, right? If you're moving from your 150 year old faucet business to now you're going to build showers and, and so you end up getting a new shareholder base. And sometimes if the showers work, that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, you talked about this earlier where you said you were going on OTC markets every day to find these potential oddballs. I mean, how else did you go out, go about and finding these potential oddball stocks? So OTC markets was good. Um, different blogs, uh, just surfing around. Now you could find people on Twitter who talk about this stuff. Um, you know, we, I, I kind of built a network of people that we ended up owning um, enough annual reports in some of these darker companies that we kind of have our own little database. Um, you know, I would look for things like I would look for um, companies that are paying, I would go and again on OTC markets. I don't know if they still have this. They changed their website and it, it went really badly for what I was doing with it. Um, but I would look for companies that were paying a high dividend in comparison to their share price. So, um, like one company I found that, um, I don't remember the name. It was like this eye care company. They, they were paying like a 50% dividend. And, um, it was crazy. And I thought this is really crazy. And then I ended up talking to the CFO and they were trying to get me to sign an NDA for every single question I asked. And it was like this really crazy thing. Um, and it turns out they ended up selling to someone at some absurd multiple because they were hiding how profitable they really were. And, um, now I own some like weird revenue payout security from the thing that is like, I've never, it's just, it's like some weird thing stuck in my brokerage. I don't know what to do with it, what I get for it. It's just a, um, yeah. So I, the high dividends, um, 
you know, like sometimes I would look for things that would drop a lot. You'd look for something that dropped like 50% in a day and um, just, you know, trawling around. I actually never, a lot of value investors talk about like 52 week lows. Um, I always found when I looked at that, it was just like trash companies that mm -hmm. were, it's like, you should probably short everything that's at the 52 week low because it's all going lower. Mm -hmm. um, I never found like gems hiding in there. It was just like a trash can full of trash. Um, but you know, they're just like, just trying to think outside the box. I also, uh, for a while would look at like, if you could segment the markets, you could say like, show me everything in, uh, France that's at 75% of book value or less. And then you just kind of like quickly look through all those companies. Um, but it, I mean, it's nothing scientific. I don't have any secret that anyone else can't do. And, you know, realistically, a lot of people do it a ton better than I do. And that's <laughs> just, that's where, you know, it's fun when people share this stuff because it's like, man, they found insights I would never find. And um, I'm looking for easy scores, right? So what I want is I don't want to spend, you know, it's, and it comes down to personality type. So there's some people who I love reading this stuff. You know, they're trying to figure out like, how efficient the machines are and the manufacturing place and how many trucks are coming in and out. And, you know, they're visiting the store and, mm -hmm. you know, the new package is eight millimeters bigger and all this stuff. And, and to me, it was like, um, you know, it's statistics, right? It's like, I, I have a better chance of doubling my money if I buy at half of book value than I do if I buy it at book value. So why not just find all the ones at half a book value that I'm not likely to lose money on? And then it's like, let me just find another pile. You know, if everything at three times enterprise value to EBITDA goes up, you know, five times, okay, then look at those things and make sure I don't lose money. And so far that's worked well. That's you know, I was going to say, Nate, you're, you're making every non-computer science major feel a lot better about themselves right now. That's a I, lot. <laughs> that's it's, a lot I, I mean, the thing is, you know, so this isn't my job. And I, I, I think like a lot of times, a lot of people in the industry, you have to justify yourself. Right. And I've worked with a lot of people who do this where they take an easy thing and make it complicated, mm -hmm. but you just take an easy thing and make it easy. And, <laughs> and that's what investing should be. It's, it's like find companies that fit a profile. And I mean, you could slice this any number of ways and, um, but if your salary depends on it, you're going to find a way to spend 40 hours a week looking at it. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people do when you could really look at it for 10 or 15 hours and decide this is worth owning and, and be done with it. So Nate, with that, where can my audience go and find more information about you and Oddball Stocks? Sure. So um, you can go to oddballstocks.com. And um, we write semi-frequently there. Uh, we also have a newsletter, oddballstocksnewsletter.com, where we cover these companies in depth. And um, that's a good place to start. Nate, thank you so much for joining me today. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you.